I'm Steve Duke, and this is the Two Roads Podcast. Today in the show, we have Juan de Francisco Rashid. Juan lives in Nairobi, and he is the general manager for a very successful and very impactful company called Mkopa in Uganda. And Juan is a super interesting guy. So here's a bit of a background on Juan. His father is from Colombia. His mother is from Bangladesh and South Africa. Juan is a citizen of both the UK and Switzerland. And now he splits his time between Kenya and Uganda. Crazy. We both worked at McKinsey around the same time until one day Juan decided to leave his job at McKinsey, leave London and go take a job at M. Coppa in Nairobi. So seven years later, he's still there and he has risen up the ranks to be general manager of M. Coppa in Uganda, where he leads literally thousands of people. The scale of this business and of his role is actually insane. And he's also a DJ in his spare time. Honestly, this guy is fascinating and we have such a good conversation. On this episode, you'll hear about why you should be honest in conversations about jobs, even if you feel like you should actually be trying to impress the person you're talking to. Why pay really does matter in a job, even if you want to take that job for experience or learnings. Why always trying new things is so important for finding a job that you love. What Juan is doing to improve the mental health of his team. What Juan's actual job looks like. What does he do on a day-to-day basis? What's it like to live in Nairobi and spend 60% of his time in Uganda? Why Juan started DJing and how he recently played 22 venues in 14 days when he went on tour and some of the absolute crazy experiences Juan has had in his life. Some that he would recommend and others he definitely wouldn't. One of those was being held at <laughs> with a knife to his neck by a butcher. But you'll learn how that happened if you listen to the episode. So Juan is a really, really interesting guy. Cool story. Really good insights in terms of how to find a job and a life that you really, really like. And he's also very empathetic with not knowing what you might want because he was in that position before and he talks about the anxiety that he felt when he was in university or in his 20s and he was trying to find a job that he wanted and it was a perfect job but he really didn't know what it was so just before we get into today's conversation there's something that i really want to tell you about and this is something that i've been working on for actually quite some time if you follow me on instagram or linkedin you may already know about it but if not What I've announced over the last week is a new program called Divergence. And this is all about trying to help people find a job that will actually make them happy. So I started this podcast with that goal. I realized there was a lot of people who were doing a job that they didn't really love, but weren't sure what it is that they did want to do. And hopefully, whether this is the first episode you've listened to, or whether you've listened to many of them, the podcast has been helpful in that way. You've been able to listen to people's stories, hear what they do, maybe get some inspiration or motivation from that. But it's still really hard to actually go through that process of figuring out what specific job is it that you'd like, what sort of lifestyle do you want, and then making that change from whatever you're in at the minute into that new career. And that's what this program is all about doing. So it's a four-week program specifically designed from all the lessons that I've learned about what works what doesn't work when trying to find out what it is that you want to do. I'm only going to run this for a small cohort of people on the first time round, So you can sign up now for the wait list so that when it fully launches and you can actually book a seat on it, you'll be first in line. If this is something that you're interested in, you can find the link in the show notes for this episode. So just in your podcast player, you can open it up and at the top of kind of the description of the podcast, you'll see the link and that's what you can use to sign up to the waitlist. And then also if you follow me on socials, all the links will be there as well. But for now, I hope you enjoy my chat with Juan de Francisco Rashid. Let's get into it. Juan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Pleasure. This video that you sent into the WhatsApp chat that you had the other day, this crazy scene of like a courtyard where you were saying in like absolutely filled with water, and there was some guy trying to like brush away like a foot worth of water. 
what the hell was going on i was like is this a metaphor for like what's happening in your life right now <laughs> or <laughs> what the hell was going on Fortunately, it's not a metaphor for what's happening in my life, although I do think that it's a metaphor for many people's Monday mornings where you're just kind of like doing the same thing and it's like not having any results, but you're doing it anyways because like, fuck it, I'm committed, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that was in Kampala. It was just outside of our office. It had been raining heavily, and when it rains heavily, often basically everything just floods. And this poor guy, clearly his job was to like clear the water with a broom, <laughs> which is like impossible here's the brief go do it and then they'll do it without questioning and there's really no point i actually wasn't sure if it was like a real video that you just taken or like something that you take in off of the internet i was just like this is this is a metaphor for something <laughs> you know i've got to capture this moment actually perfect but yeah man i'm excited to chat today i was on your linkedin i think when i was kind of doing a bit of research for this and i think you have in your bio something that <laughs> gives people some really interesting context into your background. And so you said that your your father is from Colombia, your mother's from Bangladesh and South Africa. Nationality-wise, you're British and Swiss, and now you live in Africa. So I guess what do people need to know about like your background and your childhood kind of have some context for this conversation? I think I'm one of those kids that when you, one of those people that when you ask them, where are you from? It's like, fuck, you've asked one of the most difficult questions to answer. You know, like, do you want the long, proper version or do you want the, the, the short version? It's, it's always kind of going through my head. So my, my parents are in, incredibly international. So my dad is from Colombia. Uh, my mother is from Bangladesh and South Africa. And people say, how is that possible? Well, it's not that difficult. I mean, her father is from Bangladesh. Her mother is from South Africa. So, you know, that's how it's possible. Um, but also she was born in Australia, so she has Australian citizenship. And then for me, I was born in London, so I have British citizenship. And I moved to Switzerland when I was nine, so I have Swiss citizenship. And I moved around a lot. Well, I, not a lot. I, I spent nine years in, in Bangladesh as a kid and then nine years in Switzerland. And then just so happened I spent nine years in the U.K., from a citizenship perspective, where, uh, you, you know, you kind of have citizenship in, in the UK or, or Switzerland, but um, from an identity perspective, like, is there a nationality that you identify as or are you just, you know, a citizen of the world? I obviously don't like the term citizen of the world because it's a bit obnoxious, but it is very difficult to pick one identity that works because it's kind of like saying, who do you love more, your father or your mother? And for me, my name is very Colombian. It's Juan. But I never lived there, and my Spanish is not fluent. I spend a lot more time in Bangladesh, but I don't look Bangladeshi. So I can't fit in in Bangladesh. I spend a lot of time in Switzerland, but I definitely don't look Swiss. My name is not Swiss. So I am in elements of all of these places, but it's not possible just to pick one and summarize who I am. But you don't feel the need to for your own kind of sense of identity? You're like, no, I don't need to kind of pick one. Even as a kid, I didn't really feel like it was possible. You know, I think most kids try to fit in, but I, I think I, or pretty early on I knew it was just not possible. But it's actually interesting. It's probably because of my background that I feel so at home in East Africa. And I think this is a bit of an unusual insight, but East Africa, so... Growing up, I had the sort of the hustle, the development, the sort of the developing country experience of Bangladesh, right? A, a country where you have very large family structures, you have a lot of people hustling to make a living. But I also was exposed through my father to Colombia, where you have music and dancing and, you know, this sort of joie de vivre. East Africa is this really crazy, amazing confluence of both worlds. You have the large family structures, the very openness of Bangladesh or Southeast Asia, and the, the sort of the hustle mindset. But you also have the music and the dancing and the love of life that I associate with Colombia. So for me, East Africa is this strange confluence of these two worlds that I am very much a part of. And that's why I've been here for about seven, seven years. Was that by design that you kind of noticed this and kind of sorted it out? Or was it a happy coincidence? And when you landed there, you were like, oh, my God, this is actually a lot of what I enjoy about the world. It was a total coincidence. I was working at McKinsey in London, and I was given the offer to return. For those who don't know it, it's this 
pretty special situation where they let you basically do whatever you like for a year or two. And if you want to, you can come back with a guaranteed promotion. So it's a very risk-free way to explore. And for me, I wanted to, it was geographic. It was, uh, it was, I started off with, with a sort of geographic filter in mind because I actually had the least experience in Africa. I didn't come here with any sort of pretense of like saving people or anything like that. It was just like, this is the continent that I know the least about. Let me see what I can learn about this continent. I picked East Africa by elimination. There's kind of three economic hotspots in Africa. There is Lagos, there is Joburg, and there is Nairobi. So, I mean, not counting North Africa, of course. But Joburg was a bit too familiar. I had already been there. I had family there. And it wasn't different enough, right? Lagos at the time, I'd, I'd never been. I've been since. But at the time, a lot of people basically just warned me against it. And I just sort of kind of took their advice. But also, and I think I made the right choice, Nairobi was kind of like this sort of Goldilocks city, if you like. It was like different enough, but not so uh, different as Lagos. But looking back, I think I probably made the right decision also because having been to Lagos, it's pretty intense. And it's also a little bit, it, it would have been challenging for me because I really do love nature and Nairobi and Kenya really has that. So for me, that's kind of how I ended up here. And it was a very happy coincidence that I found that I could actually connect a lot with the culture and the mindset and the lifestyle. So tell me then, what was that kind of first move like, right? So you're working at McKinsey, you get an offer to return, you decide that you want to move to East Africa, you jump on a plane, you go, did you have a job lined up? Like what was that kind of transition period like in your life? With actually a very McKinsey-like framework or approach, right? And I had three filters for what I wanted to do after McKinsey. Number one, it had to be uh, in Africa or at least in an emerging market. Secondly, it had to be something that would give me operational and managerial experience. Because I think McKinsey is great for leadership. It's terrible at management, right? It does not teach you management. Management is teaching somebody who's 40 years old and doesn't give a fuck and doesn't want to listen to you, right? That, that's management. I was such a good experience of that because I remember when I was at McKinsey, I was talking to an EM, and a, an engagement manager I had at the time. And I was like, you know, I think I want to stay at McKinsey until I become a manager so that I can experience, get experience managing people. And she was like, Stephen, uh, that's great, but you're going to get experience managing McKinsey people who are very, very different to everybody else in the world. So you'll be amazing at managing McKinsey people, but you're going to be pretty terrible at managing anybody else. And that's exactly what I'm thinking of when you're talking about there. It's like, it's not about managing like the highly motivated, you know, like 24 year old. It's about managing like the 40 year old who has absolutely no interest in doing what you want them to do. Exactly. And you know, who's very rightly more interested in getting home to their family than wait, working until 2 a.m.? to redraft a presentation that nobody's going to read? Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my second, my second thing is like sort of manager, managerial and operational experience, ideally with a path to owning a P&L and ideally with something that would give me some exposure to the investment side of things, just because it was an area that I didn't know a lot about. And I was always very sort of jealous of my sort of, so I went to high school in Switzerland. So a lot of my friends went to finance afterwards. And I was like, these guys are like pure magicians making a lot of money. What are they actually doing? And then the third filter was, look, I, again, I, I, did, I had no pretenses of wanting to save the world. But when you leave McKinsey or a sort of similar place, you actually have a lot of options available to you. So while I didn't want to sort of save people, I did want to do something that's relatively inspiring or like trying to leave the world a slightly better place than what I found it. So I wanted it to be something that I could actually sort of wake up every morning and say, yeah, this is, this is what I chose to do. So with those three filters in mind, so geography, the operational managerial experience, and then trying to do something that's relatively worthwhile. I then spoke to probably about 40 or 50 people. And it sounds like a lot, but it isn't, you know, because like you speak to your your the, the people that you've worked with, you speak to some of the partners that you've gotten more friendly with, and very quickly, most people will give you two or three names. So it kind of expands pretty exponentially. And so within actually like a, a couple of months, I'd already spoken to 40 or 50 people. And one of them uh, connected me with 
two or three people in, in East Africa. I interviewed with uh, seven different uh, companies and I picked this company called Mkopa. I'm interested in those conversations that you had. How did you approach those to kind of get the most out of them and kind of like either learn more about, you know, the opportunities that were out there or, you know, get very specific opportunities put in front of you? Like, was there anything that you did in those conversations that kind of like helped like, create those opportunities, which ultimately led to you getting a pretty cool job, right? If, if, if you're in a similar situation and you're kind of going through that process of trying to figure out what you want to do, the one piece of advice I'd give to you is be as honest as possible. Right? Like, don't try and impress people for what? Like, you know, the, the whole point of the conversation is to get something that works for you. So the more honest you can be, the more blunt people will be with you and the better the potential outcome. So, you know, you're not sort of brown nosing a partner to try and get placement on this prestigious project. You're trying to figure out what path works best for you. So you need to be honest. I think that's absolutely fantastic advice. I think it took me a very, very long time to actually learn that. Usually you're in, I need to get the job mode, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to tell them what I think they want to hear. But in these conversations, you're actually not trying to get a job. You're trying to get the job, like the job that like you want, like for yourself. And my experience of that was I was actually talking to another um, ex McKinsey guy and we were talking um, about potentially joining like the venture capital firm that he was working with. And I was like, oh, I don't think that's really for me. And so I decided I wasn't going to do it, but I was really honest with him about why I was like, look, I don't want to do this because I really want to work in mental health. That's the cause that I really care about. And I'm trying to move my career into that direction. And I feel if I take this job, you know, it's not going to be a step in that direction. And so that's why. And he came back and was like, well, actually, you know, about 20% of the work that we're going to be doing is in mental health. And we're working with this really interesting mental health research organization to do that. And so, you know, would you be interested in doing like a day a week where you work with this research organization to kind of help commercialize some of their stuff? And I was like, yes, like 100%. That would be absolutely amazing. But, you know, I was literally, when I was writing the email telling him why I wasn't, you know, really going to take the full-time opportunity, I nearly deleted the whole paragraph about like why, like the honest part of that conversation. And if I had like this new opportunity never would have cropped up. So I think that advice about being honest is um, is so good. It's not easy because people want to impress and, you know, tell people what they want to hear, but it's fantastic advice. I love it. As you go through your life, you find that, you know, the next stage is almost always very sort of prescribed or defined until you reach university, right? Like for many people kind of in our position where there's an expectation that you go to higher education, that's kind of the cutoff uh, at that point. Then suddenly, yeah, okay, some, be, some families kind of push you towards being a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or a banker, right? But really the sort of the options that you have suddenly branches out exponentially. And at that point, I think, and certainly if it was for me, there was a lot of anxiety at that point of I need to pick the right path. I need to get a good job. It needs to be prestigious. It needs to be this, 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 this. That anxiety is something that I think many people go through in their 20s. And for me, the post-McKinsey point was when I kind of left behind a lot of that anxiety because maybe because I kind of felt like, okay, I already had the McKinsey check on my CV. And I, you know, I was like, okay, well, I've done one thing that, you know, I can come back to. Uh, so I guess that's relatively privileged. But at that point, it was very different. The, the conversation that I was having maybe with myself as well as with others was very different. It was a lot more about self-exploration about what it is that's going to make me happy. And that's probably one of the reasons why I found something that seven years later, I'm still happy doing. Was there anything that you did to help you figure out what that thing was? Me, I'm, I'm quite extroverted and I found speaking to people was helpful, sort of literally your your problem solving about the best path for you and as most people will know problems are best solved in in group discussions where you kind of almost are defending a thesis and developing the hypothesis as you go along so i think for me it was really speaking to people you can get like different perspectives and they can challenge your thoughts and it's a really good way to like push and answer forwards as opposed to like if you're just trying to solve it in your own head you kind of end up going in like the, the same circles i wanted to give sort of one other thing because 
I was, so I interviewed at seven places and I got seven offers. But I think there was one thing that I learned from that process, which is there's this one place is is a really exciting venture capital firm that had a sort of emerging market focus. It was based in Africa and Southeast Asia. So I found that very exciting. It was sort of working with emerging tech. And there was a lot of like sort of things that I thought were really cool about this job. But as we started getting into conversations about the actual offer, they basically didn't really want to pay me. So they were like, look, you know, you'll get stock options in all of the investments and, you know, this could be worth millions. And, you know, this sort of usual sort of spiel of like, but what I realized was when you're in that position, pay actually does matter because pay is an indication of the company's desire and interest to, to, to kind of to have you, right? And if a company's not willing to pay you, then you have to have some sort of other guarantees that they actually care about you and will invest in you. And what I realized in, that, in those conversations was this guy was just kind of trying to take a chance with no downside to him, right? And so the other piece of advice that I give to people when they're in this position is as much as we don't like to talk about it, pay is actually an important indicator about the company's seriousness in taking you on as a as an employee yeah it's such a good point i've never thought about it that way and because even if what you're optimizing for is learning and experience although pay doesn't necessarily by definition give you that it's a very good signal for whether they will invest in that or not and if, you, if you're a manager who's sort of paid at the sort of upper end of whatever their bracket is right you know, you could be going to an NGO. That's absolutely fine, right? But if you're at the upper end, then they're going to expect results from you, right? And they're going to push you, and then you're going to learn more. But if you're coming on as a volunteer, then they don't give a fuck. If you deliver, if you don't deliver, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't cost them anything. So I think it actually does 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 influence your your prospects of, of learning, of developing, of growing. Okay, so talk to me then about you kind of accepted this offer um you moved to nairobi um talk to me t tell me a bit about um mcopa uh, what they do and then what your first role was when you first joined them so mcopa is an asset financing company what we try to do is we try to increase digital financial inclusion by helping people get access or get sort of a foothold onto onto the credit ladder at the time, we were focused very largely on solar technology. So, And it was actually quite an African problem. You did have people in Latin America and Southeast Asia who don't have access to electricity, but very small amounts, right? In Africa, it was actually still a big problem. But you have people who are excluded from the electric, the electric grid. And what we found is if you're excluded from the electric grid, you're also actually excluded from the financial sector, the traditional financial mechanisms that most like you or I have access to. And so what MCOPA tried to do is we would give people access to an asset. At the time, it was a solar home system, but now actually we've moved on to smartphones. And we would allow people to get access to that technology by paying a small deposit up front and then paying the rest of the balance over time. And as the individual customer pays the balance over time, they develop a credit history with us which then allows them to get access to loans that they would not normally have access to before. So essentially what we've done is we have given somebody who has no collateral, right? We've given them collateral and then we've allowed them to re-collateralize it so that now they have an asset that they can build against. It's been highly successful. It's been highly, we've got 3 million active customers. We've deployed $1 billion, $1 billion in, in Africa to lower and uh, to, to, to lower income and the sort of underbanked communities. We've got over 10,000 people who earn their livelihood every day from, from MCOPA, and we're based in five markets. It's been quite successful. When you say 10,000 people who make their livelihoods to MCOPA, uh, what does that mean? So we have about 2,000, 2,500, might be 3,000 employees at this stage. Uh, I think yeah, I think it's about 2,000 now. Yeah, it's about 2,000 now. But then we have about 8,000 field agents. Yeah. 
So then the rest are, are field agents, right? So so sales agents, technicians, uh, stock controllers, uh, people who are basically across the countries that we operate in, who yeah, who, who work with us. Do you actually sell the assets? Is like, do you hold like you know the smartphones, um, and sell them directly, or do they still purchase them off a third party and you just finance the purchase? In some markets, we we purchase it outright. In others, we would have it on consignment and we would sell it on behalf of a distributor, for example. But the prime, yeah. So the primary sort of connection with the customer is. I get access to this piece of technology that I really want, and then I can pay it back over time. But like to give you, to give you an example, sort of most most people in Africa will earn less than five dollars fifty a day. If the average smartphone costs one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars, that means that if you're able to save ten percent of your income and put it towards getting a smartphone, it'll take you over half a year to get that smartphone. And realistically, in that period. You're going to have a lot of income shocks. You're going to have sudden sort of expenses. Somebody in the family might die. You might have to, you know, sell or purchase or a plot of land. There's a lot that happens, which would effectively push back that goal of having a smartphone indefinitely. And that's the reason why sort of in Uganda, which is where I operate, 70% of the people don't have a smartphone. So they have feature phones, right? But they don't have a smartphone, which means that they don't have access to the internet, to digital economy. Give you another anecdote. Uganda has the unenviable world record for the longest sustained school closure. This is a result of COVID. So for two years, two years, schools were closed in Uganda. During that period, the primary method of education for children was radio which is a technology that's, you know, hundreds of years old, like a hundred years old. And basically you don't have, if you have 70% of the population without a smartphone, it means 70% of the population don't have access to the internet. And so COVID really accelerated this move towards digital inclusion. A lot of businesses that previously would have been operating in the streets started to move to smartphones and WhatsApp and social media started taking off, but you still have this problem of affordability. If it's going to take you more than six months to save up for a smartphone, then you have a serious affordability problem. And that's where we come in because you can get access to the smartphone from day one. And then what you find is people are able to use social media marketing or other sorts of forms of, of, of sales in order to make revenues that are greater than the daily payment of the phone. And there there's amazing examples of this. There's like, and it's used in ways that I would never have anticipated. So there's a fishmonger whom we interviewed, who's one of our customers, and she uses a smartphone because every morning she takes photos of the fish that she has and she sends it to her regular customers. That way her regular customers can say, I want this tilapia, I want this Nile perch and so on. And so she knows what is reserved for the customers to come and pick up at the end of the day. And what she needs to sell in the day so that she doesn't have any wastage at the end of the day. There's another example. I was actually coming home from a club and I was taking an Uber and I saw that the Uber driver had a, a Nokia, I think it was a, a 1.4 or 3.4, which at the time we were the only company in, in Uganda selling it. So I, I asked I asked the driver about it and I was like, did you buy it on cash or credit? He's like, credit, there's this amazing company called Nkopa. Have you heard of it? And I was like, yeah, no, tell me more. I, you know. <laughs> And he told me the story of how he used to be a casual construction laborer, which is one of the toughest jobs that you could imagine. You know, you turn up every day, you're hustling to get that one day of work so that you can get your two or three dollars for backbreaking work for the entire day. Then we told him he could get a smartphone on credit and he didn't have to, which is often the case. He didn't have to give a lot of collateral. Traditionally, like in, in, in Africa, interest rates are already very high and Getting access to, uh, to to loans is very challenging. Banks will often require you to put capital, uh, put collateral that's often the almost the same level as the entire loan. You might so you might like you might want to take a two hundred dollar loan and you have to put two hundred dollars up front, and then you have interest rates that are higher than the rest of the world. 
So this this construction laborer was told that he could get a smartphone. He didn't have to put up that much uh, upfront collateral. And he did it. And then he used social media marketing to like buy and sell products and so on. And he was able to save up enough to be able to rent a car. And then he used again the smartphone to use Uber to then start doing this. And he was telling this story of like, this is my office now. And like, he's like, he completely changed his life. And I, I was, granted, I was a little bit drunk at the time, but like, I was in tears by the time I got home. I'm like, this is amazing. Man, that's awesome. That's such a good story. It must be so good to like, hear a story like that. And, you know, like feel a connection to, to actually making an impact in somebody's life, but in that very like tangible way. I think sometimes you can do work and you know, it's like, yeah, okay. I, I know that theoretically I've helped people, but it's when you experience it firsthand that it becomes, it becomes a lot more real and it hits you. Tell me then about kind of like the different roles that you've had at, at M Coppa and how they've kind of changed over the years. Cause you've obviously done a few different things over that time period. In 2016, which is when I was sort of making the transition out of McKinsey, I met the CEO of M Coppa. And one of the reasons why I picked M Coppa over the other, the other offers is Number one, the business model seemed like something that you could really kick the tires on, and it seemed to be good. So my parents come from a public sector background, and I grew up with that kind of mentality of, if you want to help people, you have to be in the public sector. The private sector is about making money. The public sector is about helping people. You know, So that was kind of the distinction that, that I grew up with. And by the way, I'd had an experience in the public sector. I worked as a civil servant for two years. I interned at the International Labor Organization, so I had public sector experience. And uh, by that point, I was relatively jaded about the public sector's ability to help people because of just the inefficiencies that I saw throughout you know, those placements and, and those, those opportunities. So it was very exciting to see a private sector company that was genuinely trying to help people. And then the second reason why I picked Mkopa is because as I was going through the interview process, it was very clear that this company had a strong culture. So my first interview was with the CEO. And whereas other interviews were like, tell me a time when you led a team. Tell me a time when you solved a difficult problem. Tell me, you know, this 50% of the interview was just like, why do you want to do this? Tell me about, you know, your motivations. It was really trying to actually understand me to see if I was going to fit in within MCOPA's culture. And I thought that was really impressive because you can make the mistake of hiring that brilliant asshole who then makes the rest of the culture toxic. And it was very clear that they were trying to ensure that I wasn't that sort of like, okay, this guy is smart, but like, is he going to fit in? Is he going to like work well with others? So for those two reasons, I picked him Copa. And so then I had a one-way ticket to Nairobi. I had never been to East Africa before. And I arrived and I got started. My, my first job was the, I was essentially the chief of staff to the CEO but I was dual hatting as the head of strategy. So my job was to essentially help the CEO kind of size, prioritize, and ultimately attain sort of large scale opportunities over the sort of three to five year period. For example, international expansion was one of the things. And I was very lucky in my first year at Mkopa, I got to go to 10 African markets, which was amazing. I was in Ethiopia, in DRC, in Nigeria, Tanzania, it was amazing to be able to go to all these all these markets and, and see the opportunities, Mozambique and partnerships, new products and so on. So that was my first sort of year, year and a half. But over the course of that year, what I realized is because I was doing a lot of work for the CEO, it became it started to become quite similar to what I was doing at McKinsey. It was a lot of sort of Excel, PowerPoint, aligning stakeholders and so on. And that wasn't really why I sought to make this move. I think, you know, like we were saying earlier, honesty, honesty, and I guess vulnerability. I, I spoke with the CEO, my boss about, look, the problem, like, I love this job. I love this place, but 80% of what I'm doing is what I was doing at McKinsey, just in a different sort of environment. And I'd love to be able to flip it around so that 80% is new stuff. You know, I really wanted to get my sort of boots dirty and like go out and see the operations. And we, we realized at the time, Nairobi, well, Kenya had quite a sort of hefty management team. So there wouldn't be a lot of room for me to, to fit in and find my own uh, place there. So credit to the CEO, he, he completely agreed and he helped me find a uh, position 
that allowed me to get more operational experience. So initially, I was supposed to go to Tanzania, and I, I visited and I met the team there. But because of the macroeconomic conditions in Tanzania, at the time, the president was Magafuli, and it was quite difficult for foreign companies to be successful there. We actually took the difficult decision to close the Tanzania business. And so <clears throat> almost by accident or again by random, I ended up in Uganda. And my job there was kind of like a minister without portfolio. I kind of had very deliberately a bro- uh, sort of undefined sort of broad remit to just kind of turn around the business. And just like Tanzania, Uganda was also struggling as a business for us. So my job was to turn it around. And so I started sort of working and trying to understand the, the, the business there. And then I started taking on more and more roles. I took on uh, credit, which for us is sort of repayment of the portfolio. I started realizing that some customers were not paying us back because they were not able to get access to service for their product when it didn't work. So then I took on field servicing. I built a sort of team of 50 motorcycle riders who would go out and visit customers to try and help fix their problems at their homes. From there, I realized that we had opportunities to sell more in urban areas, so I developed a new sales channel. And then at that point, I basically kind of got the tap on the shoulder and I was told that I'm going to become the deputy general manager. And then I became the general manager with full ownership over the, the Mkopa Uganda's p That's so cool. I feel like you definitely got the hands-on operational experience that you wanted if you're designing field teams of 15 motorcyclists right like that's that's exactly the kind of like nitty-gritty like real world problems that you have to solve when you're running an actual business and not like running a business on powerpoint Uh, i presume right the fact that you're still in this role and doing these things that you actually enjoy that that side of business am i right i absolutely love it why do you think you like it so much i mean this could be a bit particular to mcopa but if you like sales, we're a sales business. We have the largest distributed sales forces in the markets in which we operate. I manage 2,500 distributed sales agents. I have to think about their incentivization. I have to ensure that they have stock. I have to make sure that they're motivated, that we understand what are the key drivers of retention, how to recruit, what are the right levels, etc. cetera. Um, so if you like sales, then yeah, we do a lot of sales. In order for that sales team to be able to have the products that they need to sell, then you need to also do distribution operations and logistics. So if you like logistics, then yeah, we do a lot of logistics because you know you have to make sure that the sales team is fed. But also we're a credit business, right? We're a loan business that does repayments and so on. So if you like credit, finance, repayments and so on, then we have a hell of a lot of that because we've got a loan portfolio of hundreds of millions of dollars that we need to ensure we're collecting against. If you're interested in customer service, of course, then you need to remember that a customer who is not happy will not pay. So you also need to be very good at customer service. And that's both retail customer service and call center customer service, right? So I had to learn about how to run a call center. So if for me, the, one of the reasons why I love the job, I mean, firstly, going back to what I said earlier, the culture is still really strong. And that's something that really sort of keeps me at Mkopa. But I love it because in my role as GM, sort of a typical day will go through sort of maybe 10 to 15 different sort of hats. I'll be in a meeting thinking about how to increase sales. I'll be in a meeting thinking about, well, what are the key drivers of improving customer service? I'll be in a meeting with investors trying to say, well, look, these are the macroeconomic challenges that we're going through, but these are the reasons why we're quite optimistic. So it's just, it's so varied. There's so many different elements of, of what I do. It's, 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 it's really fantastic. So is that what your typical day might look like then? In general, a lot of meetings, but in each meeting, wearing different hats, talking to different parties, working on different problems, but I guess actually also not just in work, but outside of work as well, right? Like, um, how would you kind of describe that? Because on this podcast, like I try and give pe- people a picture of what that looks like and not just from when you clock in at the office or on your laptop to when you sign off, but what does it look like outside of those hours? Because that's really important too, right? At McKinsey, not too much happens outside of work hours during the week. In other, in other roles, like a lot can happen. So what does that day look like for you? It's, it's maybe helpful to explain a little bit more about the kind of the structure of the team that I manage. So as the general manager from Copa Uganda, I have, I, I am essentially the most senior person in 
Uganda with regards to Mkopa. So I manage a team of 300 full-time employees and 2,500 field-time agents. And so I have sort of the ultimate responsibility of ensuring that we are kind of headed in the right direction and that the team is supported so that we can proceed, pro- pro- progress towards that direction. It's quite nice because it means that I can kind of structure the days as I like. I have quite a lot of flexibility to do what I feel needs to be done in order to ensure the business is, is running well. So um, yes, there's a fair amount of meetings, but it's, it's actually not that much. It's sort of like 20 hours of meetings a week, which is not a lot, right? When I first took on the job, it was 60, 65 hours of meetings a week. And I realized that that was not sustainable. And so I, I actually started measuring it every single week, just how many minutes was, uh, how many hours was, uh, did I spend in a meeting? And I started cutting it down very deliberately until it's, it's now 12 hours of regular meetings. So, it, you know, that sort of, and, and then I fill up with another sort of eight hours of, 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 of meetings that come up with things that have come up. But the reason for that is because I need to spend at least two days a week with no meetings so that I can either be in the trade, spending time with our customers and our front time, and our frontline staff, or so that I can be with external stakeholders, sort of general managers of other businesses, or perhaps managers in some of our third-party companies, so that I can get a finger on the pulse as to what is happening in Uganda. And I need that freedom to be able to then sort of have a slightly longer-term vision or view as to what is needed for the business, rather than just be on the day-to-day of reporting. You know Philip Dorn, right? Philip was at McKinsey. Well, he would have overlapped with us. He was at the year before me. So he was at McKinsey and he is now the CEO of HelloFresh in Ireland. He's a very, very good friend of mine. Um, I've known him for a long time, but uh, he also came on the podcast and he was talking about um, how he breaks down his time. And he had a very, very similar kind of approach to you. And he was like, look, my job as like the CEO of this business is largely to like make good decisions. And so if I spend like all my time stuck in meetings, I never have the space or like to either gain the perspective or to like actually sort my thoughts to be able to like make good decisions. And he also actually extends it to a work-life balance. And he's like, if I'm like working all the time and completely stressed out and not happy in my personal life, he was like, I'm not in a good position to make good decisions for this business. That's a really interesting perspective. He was like, they're, they're not different sides of the same coin. He's like, it's not a zero sum game. He was like, if I'm happy outside, that actually adds to my work. And that sounds obvious, but when he explains it like that and he's like, my job is about making good decisions. I'm like, oh yeah, of course it is. Like that makes so much sense. So run you through a typical week, Monday and Tuesday, I have three to four hours of meetings. Uh, some of those are like sort of reporting to group, but I do as little of that as possible. Uh, Most of it will be sort of one-on-ones with my direct reports. Wednesday and Thursday, I rarely have any meetings unless there's something that's come up. So Wednesday and Thursday are almost completely open. Then Friday morning, I'll have development conversations. So that's where I have a meeting with somebody who might be my direct report, but doesn't necessarily have to be. And the point is not, where are you on this project? The point is, what are you struggling with? How can I help? Like, let's talk through like great presentation last week, but here are a few sort of pointers on how you can make it even better next time. So Friday morning, development conversations, Friday afternoon, whatever I like to do, it could be, could be catching up and trying to wrap up some work or it could just be starting my weekend. But yeah, to that point of like, you need to make good decisions. You need to be in a good mindset. And I love that you mentioned mental health earlier on in the conversation, because that's actually become a huge, huge focus for me. And for for my team, you need to have more conversations about mental health in the workplace. And you can have that conversation entirely from a commercial perspective of like, if if your team don't have good mental health, then they're not going to be making good decisions. They're not going to be inspiring leaders for their teams. You're going to have higher attrition. You're going to have people taking sick leave all the time, right? Like, so there's a purely commercial argument for why you need to talk about mental health in the workplace. And in fact, um, it's, it's, quite fortuitous that we have the conversation now. I've just kicked off an initiative with my team where we have taken on a psychotherapist and we've given my team sort of unlimited access to a therapist, which is something I think many, many companies in, in sort of Europe and, and, and the US or, or 
in the West would do, but in, in Africa, certainly conversations about mental health and seeking therapy are not that common. So we've started a very deliberate initiative to have conversations about mental health and to give people access to therapy and to kind of break that stigma around therapy. And it's been remarkably successful. Really? What what have you found helpful for breaking stigma? What I started realizing in my one-on-ones with my team is that quite a lot of people, the majority, were struggling with mental health. Anxiety, depression. There was one month where three people took sudden leave because they just were sort of reaching breaking point. There was stuff going on at home, sort of messiness in families and so on. And obviously the workload is pretty intense. And and I realized that I realized that we needed an intervention. And so then what we did, uh, we've started playing this game called Can We Talk? It's fantastic. It's, 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 it's a series of cards that basically ask these sort of questions that are really thought provoking. It's sort of like, uh, what, when was the, like a, an example of a question would be like, when was the last time you felt calm or what hopes did you have as a child that you feel like you've not yet been able to attain? Right. And so we'll have these like dinners as a team and we'll bring out the cards and then, you know, people will be sharing, like, we started having these really, really intense, deep conversations. Somebody told us, Somebody shared in this the dinner in this dinner that you know their parents like their father had been abusive, and like, what the question was something like what about your life now would surprise you as a child, and this individual said it would surprise my, my child version that I'm married, and we're like why? He said because my father was abusive and used to beat my mother, and I made a decision that I would never get married because I never wanted to become my father. And so it's surprising that, and I was like, holy shit, this is like unbelievable trauma that this person has gone through. Um, so this talk, this, this game, Can We Talk, has really helped us kind of be vulnerable. The second thing that we did was we brought this brilliant psychotherapist in for a talk actually on vulnerability and the importance of breaking the stigma on mental health in the workplace. So she gave this talk about this. And it was amazing just to see the, the energy in the room shift. This is one of our sort of retreats where we sort of every three to six months, we, we get out of the office, we talk about sort of what we're going to achieve commercially, but we kind of broke the day with this, can we talk exercise? And then we brought the psychotherapist in to have this conversation. And then afterwards, people had access to one-on-ones with, with, with her for therapy. I think that, I think both of those are incredible, but that that card game seems like a really nice and kind of simplistic, like easily accessible way, you know, to open up these interesting conversations. And everybody has some shit going on, right? Like everyone's got something, (laughs) you know? Oh, that's cool that you're doing it though. I'm sure that the people in your team and in the business, um, like feel that I'm sure it has a big impact on them. And also me, you know, the other thing about being a GM is kind of, it's lonely at the top you know, when I first joined the, the Uganda business, I was, you know, I was a manager and I was different, but I was still a relatively junior manager. So I could sort of be friends and be friendly with people. Now I am friendly with people, but it's harder to be friends because you're the person who is calling the shots. So, yeah, that's a challenge. And so it's nice to be able to kind of create this environment of openness and vulnerability within the team that I directly work with. I want to talk about some of the stuff that you do outside of work. Last week, actually, I was on your SoundCloud. I was listening to some of uh, some of your mixes. They they got me through a huge amount of work, actually. <laughs> I think I saw somewhere that you said that, you know, the music that you create is around um, getting people to dance. And uh, although I wasn't up dancing around my city, you know, I was I was definitely dancing in my mind. I felt it. Um, and I was actually getting a huge amount of work done. It's, it's cool music. Yeah, what what... Talk to me about DJing. What drew you to it? Like, how do you DJ? When do you do it? Tell me. I want to know. So I've always grown up around music. My parents are incredible hosts. Um, They love music. And, you know, my mom listens to a lot of Motown, funk, soul, and so on. My dad listens to a lot of salsa, cumbia, 
bachata merengue and so on. So, you know, you've got the sort of Afro-Latin experience uh, or exposure as a kid growing up. And then suddenly I find myself in East Africa, which has an incredible, incredible diverse uh, of music. I used to be the guy who'd sort of take my, take my iPhone and sort of plug it into the speakers of the party and I'm sort of playing the tunes to, to do that. And then over time, I kind of realized that there's actually a slightly, slightly more technical way to play music, right? And to, to mix music. And so then most of my most of my sort of exposure was listening to and just playing music on Spotify or whatever. And then relatively recently, I started getting into more technical uh, mixing. And it's just been absolutely fantastic. Just being able to play music and, and get people dancing is, is, is such a treat. What was like the first step, right? Like, how, you know, how did you go from listening to music on Spotify to like, oh, I think I can now try and actually mix music in a slightly more technical way? Like, what, you know, did you do like a course or did you just learn online or what did you do? So I think many people kind of have this misconception that DJing is sort of 90% technical mixing. And, you know, um, I, 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 I actually don't think it's the case. For me, 90% is picking the right song. That's going to connect with the audience. Ninety percent of that. Ten percent is then just like harmonically or beat matching, sort of making sure that it works with the previous song, and then you know maybe fine. Maybe seven percent is that, and three percent is FX and and scratching or you know whatever sort of flares you want to throw in. But ninety percent is just picking the right song. So for me, it started by you know that moment where there's a room of like it could be five people, it could be fifty people, and you're the one who says. This is the song that people are going to connect with. It's going to be Justin Timberlake or 50 Cent or, you know, whatever it is, right? That's that moment. Once you make that decision, I'm going to be the one who taps on that song and plays it. And people are going to either connect with it or hate it. That's the moment that I think I, I think that I became a DJ. Then it was a case of, yeah, getting my sort of first experience on a controller learning how to, you know, use tractor or record box or whatever. Um, and, and, and that process was uh, helped a lot by the fact that I, through sort of partying and so on, I met a lot of DJs in East Africa. And so then those DJs then kind of took me under their wing and showed me the technical aspects of mixing, helped me sort of figure out my way between the different sort of DJ softwares. Ultimately, I bought a controller and then I started sort of, DJing at parties, and then they let me sort of DJ at gigs, and then supplemented that knowledge that the DJs were giving me with YouTube. And I think YouTube is a fantastic teacher. You can you can learn so many things on it. So yeah, yeah. So YouTube also helped a ton. And then before long, I felt sort of playing at gigs and and festivals and actually touring, which is fantastic. It's so much fun. Yeah, I spent like. Yeah, sort of within the first year, I, I had my first tour. It was two weeks. We played like 22 different locations in a two-week period. And it was insane. It was unbelievable. I like barely slept. It was crazy. And it was so much fun. I like the buzz of like standing there and like hitting play on a song and like watching a crowd react. That must be an amazing feeling. It, it is awesome. In terms of like picking that song, is it all just like feel, like a feel of a crowd and a feel of environment and just kind of feeling a song that you think is going to hit? Or, you know, is there kind of a more rational or like technical side to understanding what song to play next? It's both, right? So let's say you're playing a song at, I don't know, 115 BPM, which is the typical BPM, the beats per minute of... Ama piano, which is a genre of music that's really popular right now, right? Um, if you're playing at 115 BPM, then if you want to go much higher or much lower, you need to be making a conscious decision to change the BPM and therefore the energy to get there, which is fine. Right? There's no reason why you cannot do it. You can go from 115 to like 80 or 90, which is where you know a lot of hip hop is. Or you could go to 120, 125, which is where a lot of house is. Or you can go to 126, 128, 132, which is where a lot of techno is. That's fine. But you need to be making a conscious decision. So the way I kind of think of it is you're kind of within certain ranges. 
and it's easier to then sort of keep within that range. So you could stay within Ama Piano or play other sort of maybe sort of slower disco house songs in that range. Um, and then make that conscious decision to switch it up, but then you need to do that. There are some DJs that like move around like crazy BPM ranges and like every single song is different, but they somehow make it work. That is a sort of magic that I've not yet really been able to achieve and I'm not even sure it's possible for me. But for me, I kind of like try to stick within these sort of general ranges and then move it up when I when I feel like the energy needs to shift. You struck me as a guy who's done some pretty cool things, right? You lived in different areas, you've traveled a lot. I want to know, like, what are some of the coolest things that you've ever done? I've got a bucket list and I'm always interested for like new things and not the things that I'm going to find if I Google. Like the kind of like random things that somebody's done, right? Or the local experiences that they've had. What are some of the coolest things that you've ever done? I was a photojournalist in Beirut during the Arab Spring. It was so much fun. I got to experience some wild things. I got held up by Hezbollah and sort of taken to an underground prison and basically watched as people were beaten up in front of me, knowing that I was going to be next because I had taken photographs in the wrong area camera confiscated and then I had to go back and ask them the next day could you please give me my camera back <laughs> I promise I won't take more photos actually another time in that same month I had like a butcher had a knife to my neck because I had taken again photographs in the wrong area so that was a bit wild <laughs> hiking in the Amazon rainforest was unbelievable unbelievable experience and actually something that's pretty easy to do and a lot less dangerous than being a photojournalist. How did, how did you do it? I was in Colombia and from there I flew to the border of Brazil and there was this, uh, I'll try and dig up the name, but there's this, it used to be a scientific observatory where basically scientists would go and spend a couple of months doing field experiments, trying to understand what's going on in the rainforest. But relatively recently at the time, they had opened it up to, to tourists, but it was kind of unknown. So it was really, really interesting to be able to go there. And so you're, you, you have scientists there who are actually doing like live sort of observations and studies, but you can also go there and just hike around with the, with the tour, tour guides. So it was a really, really cool experience that I'd encourage people to do. And they made the best caipirinhas that I've had in my life. Okay, I was like 50-50 before it net, but now I'm sold. That's it. I'm in. <laughs> and I've got a couple of questions before we finish up. Like we could talk for a very, very long time. You know, you talked earlier about in university when you were there and kind of having this anxiety over a career or what it is that you wanted to and trying to find the right thing. Um, you know, it's a good few years later now. Not a crazy amount, but a bit. If you were to go back and kind of talk to yourself when you were at that point in university, what would you say to yourself? Part of me would want to say, chill out, relax, it's going to be okay. But a bigger part of me knows that if I told my younger self that, my younger self would tell myself to fuck off. Because everybody was telling me, relax, it's going to work itself out, don't worry. And like, it, like, at the, well, what, like you're, you're in your 20s, you're like, at least for me, I was so stressed, I was so anxious, I was so concerned everybody was telling me look you're fine you're gonna be okay and i didn't it didn't register so i don't know i don't i don't think i would give myself advice because i don't think i would listen to it i'd probably tell my younger self buy stock in apple and amazon yeah i think that's probably more practical advice hopefully your younger self would have actually listened to you what's the period that you think you learned the most or the most interesting one Sure. I think the most interesting one is, is actually the last couple of years because it's where I moved from an individual contributor towards being a manager of others. And then what have you learned about yourself over that period? And the biggest lesson that I've learned is it's not about you. You know, like for the first five years of your career, probably it might be longer, it might be less, but maybe roughly the first five years of your career, all of your success is based on what you do. Right, what you achieve. It's like, well done, Stephen, you got the report out, you busted your nuts till 3 a.m., but you got it done, right? And it's all based on what you do. And then as you become more successful or as you become more recognized, then inevitably in most organizations, you get asked to manage others. At that point, it's not about you. 
right? It's about how well you can develop others so that they can contribute. That's probably been the biggest lesson of like moving from an individual contributor towards developing others so that they can bring their best selves to work. And that's where all the conversations that we've had about sort of mental health, about emotional intelligence, also knowing yourself and, and the conversations we we're having earlier about honesty, all these things come into play. Because if you're not honest with yourself, if you're not okay with yourself, then it's very hard for you to help others. And then my last question is, right, so, so this is a podcast for helping people to kind of navigate their own path and figure out what job and what career, but even kind of what life they want to live, right? If you've got somebody who is in that position of, you know, they're in their 20s, they're doing, they're doing something, right, and it's fine. Like they don't hate it, but they just know it's not the thing that they want to do forever. But they don't know what it is that they do want to do, right? Because I think that's sometimes a hard question to answer. Um, would you have any advice for those people in terms of what they might be able to do to start down a path towards getting that clarity to knowing what it is that they actually might want to do? Let's start off by saying it's okay that you don't know what you want to do. You probably know what you don't want to do. And that's a start, right? Because I think at that period, a lot of people are just like, they feel so helpless because they don't know what they want to do. But it's like, hey, it's okay. You know that there's a couple of things that you don't want to do. So it, you've started, right? It's okay. You're already on your way towards where you need to be. So that's the first thing that I'd say. The second thing I'd say is, well, then, what are some of the things that you might be interested in? And how can you start to get some exposure so that you can start to try them and figure out if they work for you? But ultimately, you should try things you know i've worked as a kitchen boy i've worked in a pr agency i've worked as a journalist i've um you know interned in more places than i can count i've tried lots of things and um it's through trying try trying and, and failing that you figure out what what path is for you so so don't be afraid to try matt i think that's fantastic advice i think it's a fantastic place for us to finish the episode thank you so much for coming on i learned a ton i had an absolute blast i hope you found it somewhat enjoyable as well this, this is awesome i really enjoyed this i really appreciate it thanks man thank you i hope you enjoyed that conversation that i just had it was a wild one um but lots of really interesting things to take and hopefully a few learnings as well. If you want more of this content, go and follow me on socials. Instagram is Two Roads Pod and on LinkedIn, it's Steve Duke. But apart from that, I will see you next week for the latest episode of the Two Roads Pod.